concerning the subject of intimacy with God. It has not been exhaustive by any means. It has not been uh, in depth by any means. It has been uh, just a perusal of some of the incredible dynamics of this concept that God wants to be intimate with us. Intimacy uh, produces uh, fruit, and so uh, God wants our lives to produce fruit, and so he wants to be intimate with us and we with him. So we talked about his call to intimacy. We talked about his, 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 his desire to have intimacy with us. We talked about the whole concept of, of God remembering our vows last Sunday. Do you remember that? When God told Jacob to go back to Bethel 28 years, 30 years after he had made his vows to the Lord at the, at the, at the great story of the ladder that ascended down from heaven or descended from heaven while he was running from his brother Esau. And we talked about how God remembered the vows that, Esau, that, that Jacob had made and God told him to get back to Bethel. Last Sunday we talked about going back to Bethel, to the place where we made our vow to the Lord. And so many of you, maybe 200, maybe 250 of you, after the ministry of the word, gathered around this altar and just cry out to God again to, to renew these vows before the Lord. And so we, we've been going down that journey. Today I, I want to move towards the conclusion. It may take me a couple of Sundays, the Lord willing and allows, but I want to talk about this whole idea of intimacy with God and, 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 and God's incentive uh, that he gives us and God's faithfulness towards us. And the God says in, in his word that if we walk with him and we, we are faithful to our vows, that God would do something incredible. And I don't know if I've ever heard another message preached quite like this one. I'm sure I haven't. And, and I just want to draw it to your attention today. It is found in the book of Leviticus, and we will support it from other scriptures as a principle from God's word. So in Leviticus chapter 25, keep in mind now Leviticus is a book of worship. Leviticus is a book of worship. It is in Leviticus that God defines for the nation of Israel in the time before Christ how they were to come to God for, to worship. He instituted the sacrificial system, which was a prototype of the of the of Christ that would come and give his life. And so Leviticus is in, in effect until Calvary, but yet the principles of Leviticus are eternal. So keep that in mind. And so in the book of Leviticus chapter 25, at verses 1 to 7 and verses 18 to 22, let me read them to you and you can follow along in your, in your scriptures. And the Lord spake unto Moses in Mount Sinai, saying... Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when you come into the land, not if you come into the land, when you come into the land, which I will give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Six years you shall sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year, listen to this now, in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. You shall neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. That which groweth of its own accord of thy harvest thou shalt not reap, neither gather the grapes off the vine undressed, for it is a year of rest unto the land. And the Sabbath of the land shall be provision for you, for there, for thee, and for thy servant, and for thy maid, and for thy hired servant, and for thy stranger that sojourneth with thee. And for thy cattle, and for the beasts that are in thy land, shall all the increase thereof be the supply. It, what an unusual, what an unusual command from God. What an unusual principle from God. God said, the six years you shall grow and you shall reap. But he said, in the seventh years, you should let it lie dormant. Well, obviously, something got to give here. Obviously, something's got to happen here. So if you, as a family, decided you were not going to buy groceries for a whole year, you'd kind of want something to supply what you need for that year. See, they were a, an agricultural society. 
They weren't in a, a, a manufacturing or a nuclear or a, any other type of society. They weren't even a fishing society. They were an agriculture. Their, their livelihood came from the fields. Understand that. Their livelihood came from the fields, and they didn't have any real big change. There was no Sobeys. There was no Fortinos. There was no, no Frills. There was none of those great chains of grocery stores. So what's going on here? Well, let's drop down to the 18th verse. The 18th verse, wherefore ye shall do my statutes and keep my judgments and do them, and ye shall dwell in the land in safety, and the land shall yield her fruit, and ye shall eat your fill and dwell therein in safety. And so God being God, anticipating their question, their obvious question, said, and if ye shall say, what shall we eat the seventh year? Behold, we shall not sow nor gather in our increase. Then will I command my blessing. Underline that piece of scripture in your Bible. If you've got an highlighter, highlight it and underline it the second time. God said, I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year, and it shall bring forth fruit for three years. And ye shall sow the eighth year, and eat yet, yet of the old fruit until the ninth year, until her fruit come in, ye shall eat of the old store. Wow. God is saying to us, if we walk in intimacy with him, if we walk in obedience with him, if we walk in unquestionable obedience and trust, that he will command his blessing upon us. I want that word to sink in today. It's an unusual word. He will command his blessing upon us. Now, this, this, this concept of commanding his blessing upon us because of our intimacy and obedience to him is not the, 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 the normal, general way that God blesses society. How many understand here today that the breath we breathe comes from God? How many understand that the oxygen level in the air that we breathe comes from God? How many understand that the water we drink comes from God? We may look at a great river. We may walk by a great the water supply for our city and say, what a great water supply. The city is not supplying that water. God is. God is supplying that water. Otherwise, it would be a famine and there'd be no water. So God is not talking about the general provisions here that he has made for mankind in general ways. For the scripture says in Mark, Matthew first, chapter 5 and verse 45 that he makes the rain to fall upon the good and the evil. We see, we see the evil of men and the evil of man's mind, and yet God does not withhold the rain from them. The rain falls upon all of us. So it's not a general thing that God is talking about here. In, in, in Psalms, in several occasions in Psalms, the Bible says he bestows his blessings and his benefits upon us daily in Psalm 68, Psalm 103, and Psalms 116. It is not, it is not the general blessings that we enjoy as a nation from the good hand of God. No, God's commanded blessing is the product of an intimacy with God. Let me say it again. For the man or the woman, for the family, for the teenager that walks in intimate relationship with God. And we've been talking about intimacy in the last three or four weeks. God said, I will command my blessing upon you. I won't suggest it. I won't think about it. I will command my blessing upon you. I will command. It is a divine principle given because of obedience. Somebody say amen. amen. I, I find Christians living disobedient to God. And they're wondering why they're out of this, out of that, out of something else, why this goes wrong, something else goes wrong. Well, pastor, I'm a Christian. Why can't I enjoy what God promised? You need to walk in obedience to God. I need to walk in obedience to God. Even when it hurts the flesh, I need to walk in obedience to God. You understand what I'm saying now? 
It's easy to obey God when that obedience uh, favors us. But when God asks us to do something that doesn't favor us but is testing us, we need to walk in obedience with God. God said, I will command my blessing upon you. I looked up the, the meaning of that word command. It means to direct with specific authority. It is not a general suggestion. It is a, it is a, a direct order. I remember when I served the, a great mining company in the north, and I was a supervisor with that company. And, of course, we had management and we had unions. Some of you today know what unions are. Some of you know what management is. And there was always those people who were breaking the rules of safety and breaking the rules of production and putting the rules of the lives of other people at risk and putting the equipment at risk and putting the production at risk. And so we had, we had a system to make sure that things work right. And if I had the authority to go way beyond suggesting something, I had the authority to give what was called a direct order. Whether you agree with it or not wasn't important. You had to do it. Now you had a grievance process afterwards if you felt that it was unfair, but the truth was when I issued a direct order, when I said, this is a direct order, I'm asking you to perform that task now. That employee had no choice. It was a direct order. It was a command from the supervisor operating under the directions of the company guidelines. And so command means a specific order given with specific authority. It means to issue that order under that authority and put it forth to, for it to be done. To direct from a position of authority. As a supervisor with the company, I had the authority. Brother Lambert Stacy was also a supervisor with the same company. He knows what I'm talking about. The last thing we wanted to do was issue a direct order. We wanted to find some way. But if we had an obstinate employee who was intended on just being evil and just not getting the work done, we had the authority, and it was a direct authority. It was a directive given with, usually with a loud voice. Usually with a loud voice. It was an order given by one in authority. It was the possession or exercise of controlling authority. And so God said, I will command my blessing upon you. Stop for a moment. When we walk in intimacy with God, when we walk in a way that pleases God, God will command his blessing. Think about that for a moment, church. You and I can have that kind of relationship with God that when all of the natural things around about you says that it won't work for you, you can't succeed, God commands a blessing and you succeed. You're serving God faithfully, you, 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 you worship Him, you walk according to His Word, you walk in, in terms of obedience to tithe and offering and serving the Lord, and, 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 and there's a job position comes up, and you're not as qualified as 10 of the people in front of you, and you say, there's no way I can get that job. I haven't got the experience, I haven't got the, the, the full requirements that they ask for, there's no way I can get it. But you say, God, is there some way you can open that door for me? I'll walk through it. And you get the job. You know where that came from? A commanded blessing of God. And you exceed in that job. You excel in that job. And the supervisor comes by after the first year for review and says, boy, did you fool us. You didn't have the credentials, but we just felt there was something about you. There was, we, we had higher qualified, more experienced, and more educated candidates. And, but, but there's some reason or other that the team that hired you felt there's something about this girl. There's something about her. I know this could backfire on us. There's something about her. We got to hire her. Where do you think that came from? It came from God. Let me say it again. It came from God's commanded blessing. He created that position for you because you pleased him. You walked intimately with him. You knew him and he knew you and he put his favor upon it. That's what I'm talking about. God said, I will command my blessing upon you. I will command my blessing. 
I see three particular areas in the Bible when and where God says he will command his blessing. This morning I hope to look at these and probably conclude this portion of intimacy next Sunday if the Lord allows me. But I see three particular areas in the Bible where he said if we will walk in intimacy with him. Intimacy means obedience. It means trust. It means stepping out to be one that is intimately connected with God through his word and by his Holy Spirit. He said there's three areas where he said if you will do these three things, I will command my blessing upon you. In the area, first of all, of obedience and trust. In Leviticus 25, 1 to 7, and in the text that I read in 18 to 21, God required both. Here in these texts that I read to you, it is linked directly to the law of the Sabbath, which is the law of rest. This law of rest and law of Sabbath, what was it all about? It was that singular thing that identified Israel as a people who proclaim God to be their Jehovah, or Jehovah to be their God. You can imagine the heathen around them when they saw them not sowing their ground in the seventh year. They said, what's wrong with the Israelites? What gotten into that tribe? Or all 12 of them. They're not planting their fields in the seventh year. It became an occasion for the Israelites to say to their neighbors, we are walking in obedience to God, our provider. We are, we are sacrificing the seventh year for his glory and for his honor as he has commanded us. And we have done this for many, many cycles of seven. And we have seen God provide as we have been obedient and trusted God for the provision. It's an incredible principle. It was the Jews' observance of the Sabbath that proclaimed their recognition of Jehovah God. What did God say to them? You will have your Sabbath day, and then you'll have your Sabbath year. The year when the land rests. We, might, we must not be surprised when we read this. For guess who made the soil? Guess what farmers are finding out today and a few years ago? That if you give your land a particular rest at a particular time, it rejuvenates and produces greater crops. I am amazed at how practical the Word of God is. I'm amazed at the wisdom contained in the Word of God, not just for great matters like salvation, but for great matters like everyday living. He said, if you'll do that, you will grow enough in the sixth year to last three years. Woohoo! Your barns will be full. Your wine presses will overflow. You say, how does this apply to us today? Simply this way. That you and I, as believers, are, a cult, are part of a culture and society obsessed with ourselves, aren't we? It's all about me. It's all about us. It's all about our. And God is saying to us, take a break. You've got yourself worn out. You're tired. You're broken. Your health is broken. Your patience is broken. Give it a break and rest in me. We are all busy bees, aren't we? Yes, we are. Come on now. Oh, I haven't got time. I'm rushing to another appointment. I'm so, I'd love to do that, but you know what? You ought to see my Blackberry. It's a calendar like this. Now, all my younger pastors, they got these fancy... So when I need to make a schedule, I had to open my bold black case and I, I pull up my calendar. That's my Blackberry. That's my iPad. And if you look at it, it can get filled up in no time. Right, brethren? Whether it's 
high tech or low tech. <laughs> it still gets filled up. And we're all so busy, we're obsessed. We have many times in our pursuit of things compromised our devotion and our worship, have we not? You know, I'd love to have time for this. I'd love to have time for that. But I'm so busy. Every time the pastor calls a prayer meeting, I got so much going on. Every time there's evangelistic services, I just can't get there about Sunday because I got so much going on. We need to take a little time out. We need to know how to say no sometimes to all the demands upon us. And we need to schedule God's time first and everybody else second. Because here's what happens to the preacher as it happens to the parishioner. We fill up our calendar and then we find that we can only jot God in here and there. But I'd love to have gotten to the prayer. I know you're having prayer. I couldn't, but I couldn't. You know, I had this appointment. You know something? There is a kind of Christian that thinks the busier their calendar, the more important they are. Foolishness. Foolishness. Busyness doesn't mean importance. Business sometimes means bad priorities. Sometimes we need to spend time with our little honey and our children rather than rushing off to another, rushing off to another, rushing off to another. Ooh, I'm digging deep now. I can sense your love coming at me now full speed. You see, the truth is, the busier we become, the more the spiritual disciplines in our lives has been relegated to a low level. Oh, I love the way you're shouting now. Let me say this to you this morning. Never let your blessings from God get in the way of your worship and devotion to God or your godly disciplines. Now, I come from the simplest background that you can ever imagine. I came from a generation of fishermen and loggers. Nothing I tech about it. You set up your net, you pulled your net, you cleaned your fish. You took your buck saw, not even chainsaw. How many know what a buck saw is? Let me see. Right, not even a chainsaw. Buck saw is the big old thing like that with the frame and it's got a blade. And you just work it through until the wood drops off. Chainsaw is the thing that makes noise. I came from a generation where it began with a buck saw. And they were simple people, simplistic people, but they were faithful people. My dad was a fisherman in the summertime, a logger in the fall, and in the winters he got his gear ready for fishing in the spring. Let me tell you a little story from my dad's life. Now, I, I'm talking about the early to mid-50s. I mean, it was ancient history. My dad was fishing. And he had a very simple apparatus, just a couple of fishing nets, that he pulled by hand, show water. For all you guys in the East Coast, you know the difference between deep water and shore water. For all you mainlanders here, deep water, you can't see the bottom shore water, you can. And he, he was a simple fisherman with a large family. There was nine children. And fishing was not all that plentiful. But this day, my dad went out and pulled his nets. Some of you might have heard me tell this story. And he had a great catch. He had a wonderful catch. Between, between the nets he had out and the old-fashioned jigging, he had a boatload. Now, that wasn't a big boat. It was, still, it was a really, really, really good catch. So he came in on this particular evening and and the word got around the community because they could see that his boat was well laden down in the water when he came in. 
And so the men began to gather on the wharf. And, and they were all excited for my father because he had this wonderful catch of fish. And it was late in the evening when he came in, about 6 o'clock or so, and after toiling all day. And, and so to clean a boatload of fish is like four to five hours work. And it's about 6 in the evening. So they come, and they, his name was Donald, and they called him Uncle Dodd. And they said, well, Uncle Dodd, you, you've done so well today. You have a great catch of fish. He said, yes, you know, it's been good. We had a good day. And so they're standing on the wharf. And I guess up here in Ontario, that's called a dock. But where I come from, it's a wharf. And really, where I come from, it's a wharf. <laughs> really, I'm just trying to be fancy. And so... He, he ties up his boat. It's 6 o'clock in the evening. He's got probably a couple of hours before sunset. And, and here's what needs to be done. That fish needs to be taken out, cleaned. I, yeah, I may as well say it. Gutted. It taken off and split. Split means the sound bone comes out so the fish lies wide open. If you go to any of Sobe's store and say, I want some salt fish, you get split fish. That's what I'm talking about. So this is a mammoth task, and everybody knew it. Now, if you don't do that fish in a very soon time after it's cut, it becomes very soft, the flesh becomes very soft, and it spoils rather quickly. I'm setting the stage for you, because it's worth telling. And so Dad gets up, he, he, he secures his boat, and he just makes a few remarks to the men that they are complimenting on his success for the day, and he begins to take off his rubber clothes. Not what a fisherman does when he's getting ready to clean fish. He takes off his rubber clothes, and he's standing there just in his, his regular work clothes. And he hangs up his rubber clothes or throws it up on the splitting table. And he begins to walk up over the hill to his house. And the men look at him a little bit surprised and say, Uncle Dad, where are you going? He said, this is Tuesday night. And I'm going to the prayer meeting. And they said to him, but Uncle Don, the fish is going to spoil. The fish is going to go soft on you. Dad looked at him and said, the God who put it in the net will keep it until after the prayer meeting. <laughs> Folk, that's what I'm talking about. That's, that's my heritage, that's my convictions, that's what I'm talking about. In today's language, it's absolutely nuts and crazy. No, it's not. It's honoring God. It's not letting the blessings of God take us away from the, com from the commands of God and from the worship of God. What happens? We, we, seek, we, get, we have a little business going. We, we're not doing that well. We seek God's face and we call upon God and God provides for us. Our business starts to grow and all of a sudden, we're not calling on God anymore. Come on now, let's be honest. Oh, that's not exactly right. We don't spend time with God. We grab God somewhere between one red light and Tim Hortons. We got to get on to the next appointment. Folk, I believe God is speaking to you and I and saying, slow down a little bit. I want your attention. I want your devotion. And don't worry, I have commanded my blessing up on you. It's the product of our relationship with God. With such busy lives, we too often neglect our worship. And we, and we all have done, because we're busy, or because we've been, so, here's the other one. We're so busy, we haven't had time, so we just need a, to get a little rest and relaxation. Hmm. While our Sunday observances are completely different from the Old Testament Sabbath, yet the principle still remains we need to have a specific time to recognize God. And that's what God was saying to the Israelites here. And so to the agricultural Israelites, he said, Do not sow or plant your fields or your vineyards in the seventh year. Wow! That don't make sense. 
We live by, by the fields. We live by the crops we grow. To be obedient to that principle takes trust and understanding of who God is. Much obedience. You say, Pastor, you sure that's what God meant? Like, you sure? I mean, that's not symbolic language or he was speaking. No, no, that's what he meant. Why do you think Israel spent 490 years in captivity? The Bible tells you. Because they neglected the Sabbath year for 70, 70 times. And God said, seven times the times that you neglected to walk in obedience to my agricultural demand, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep you in captivity 490 years, seven times 70. The scripture says that. The scripture says it. So, so if we're neglecting God and think he's going to wink at us, he's not. Why doesn't he wink at us? Because he loves us. And he knows that the path we're on when we neglect intimacy with him and neglect being obedient to him leads to destruction. And God keeps calling us back. And he's going to get our attention one way or the other. You put your business before God as a believer, you can look for a, a wreck down the road. Now let me get really technical here. You put your family before God. Look for trouble. God is first. Everything else falls in place. And I'm going to be honest, folks, my spirit is stirred. I'm not seeing a church today. I'm not seeing Christianity today putting God first. I'm seeing Christianity and churches today going after all the world's going after and fitting God in where they can and giving them a limited time. Now, God, you got this little moment here. That's when we're together. After, don't bother calling us. Oh, we don't say that. We just live it out. You still love me? Well, we're getting there. God knew our humanity. God knew Israel's humanity. And, and, and so he anticipated their question. In the 25th chapter of Leviticus chapter 20, he says, You shall say, what shall we eat on the seventh year? We shall, you don't want us to sow. You don't want us to gather in the increase. He said, if you walk in obedience, then will I command my blessing upon you. In the sixth year, you, you will reap three, enough for three years' supply. The truth is, our society today is, and, and, and our churches, Pure Pentecostal is, is, is guilty as well. We are self-sufficient. But we are only one moment away from disaster. The moment we begin to look to man and look to our own abilities, God is going to take his blessing off of this church. The moment we begin to think we have arrived and we're something, God is going to lift his blessing off this church. We need God every day. Mom and dad, you need God every day. Your family needs you to see that principle. Your family needs God every day. If we are going to enjoy the commanded blessing of God, we must live in surrender to him. And sometimes we don't call on God only when we realize we are in trouble. God didn't just say that he would command his blessing upon us. He said he would also secure our safety. Look at the 19th verse here. The land shall yield their fruit. You shall eat your fill and you shall dwell therein in safety. Why do you think the Western nations of the world who have always enjoyed incredible safety and protection and, and peace because of the goodness of God are now beginning to crumble and are now beginning to see up evils and unrest? Why do you think? Because the Western nations have forsaken God. If I could tell you the story of the first Thanksgiving in the colonies of the Americas, it would turn your heart to mush and your eyes to tears. 
when they realized that all, the little they had was what God had given them, and they consecrated it to God, and God blessed them. Now the mighty Western society, Canada included, and the United States are boasting in their own self-sufficiency. I get scared at that. I'm saying, oh God, help us not to lose sight of our daily dependence upon you. Remember the meaning of the word command. God will order and direct with authority his blessing upon those who keep his word and trust him. Those who keep his word and trust him. I must hurry. There's the second area where I see this promise clearly put forth in the word of God. It's in the area of unity. It's in the area of unity in Psalms 133 and, and, and 1 to 3. It's, so, it's such a familiar passage to most of you. Some of you don't even need to turn to it, so you can turn anyway to make sure I read it correctly. 133 and 3. Let's, let's read it together. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garments as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descends upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing. Here it is again. When there is unity, God commands a blessing. You want a blessing from the Lord? Live in unity. God will command his blessing upon those who strive to keep unity. It doesn't mean that we may not have our disagreements. That we will have disagreements. I have disagreements with my staff. They have disagreements with me. I don't understand that. <laughs> you have disagreements with one another in the body of Christ. You're, within your own personal family, you have disagreements. But disagreement don't mean that you've got to be in disunity. You and I can disagree on a matter, and because of our love for God and each other and for the house of God and the things of God and what God is doing in our lives, we just set our own personal biases apart, and we come together to serve God's purpose. Amen. We might die with difference of opinion. No big deal. If we die with difference of opinion and we're right with God, we'll have a chance to discuss it on the streets of glory. No, let me change that. When we get to glory, you will find out I was right. Just kidding you. I'll find out that you were right. Amen. But it didn't make any difference because we didn't let disunity come in. We can be disagreeable on things, but we don't have to be in disunity. We can have difference of opinions, but we respect each other. We can have different approaches to solving a problem, but we respect each other. The devil thrives on disunity. The devil can identify disunity in the most successful, most spiritual body of Christ on earth. And when he gets disunity going, he can go and walk away because he's got his work done. It'll spread like a virus. And like they shut the meat plant out down, down, down out west, they'll shut, they'll church, just shut the church down. Because it's worse than E. coli. Disunity will destroy the body of Christ. And God said, if you will strive for unity, I'll command my blessing. You mightn't be the biggest church, you mightn't be the richest church, but I'm going to command my blessing upon you. I want Peel Pentecostal to live under the commanded blessing of God. Woo! I don't want God to make us perfect. It would be contradictory to his principle. We're going to be perfect when we get to heaven. I just want us to walk in unity in the body of Christ. Even over matters that we can, be dis that we can disagree on, it doesn't add to affect our unity. Unity brings a sweet aroma. Unity brings a refreshing atmosphere. It results in God commanding his blessing of life. When we nurture an atmosphere of unity, well, let me take you there, Ephesians chapter 4. Listen to what happens when we nurture unity. We nurture unity. It just doesn't happen, folks. We nurture it. Keep that in mind. You and I have the potential to create disunity in this church at any time. Think about it. You and I have, have, the, have, the, have the ability to, to create disunity in this church at any time. On the flip side of the coin, you and I have the power and authority to nurture unity. I choose the flip side. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. Listen to what it says. 
I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, Paul writing, beseech you that you walk worthy of the Lord, worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. What's your vocation? You're called to be a Christian. What's a Christian? One who is Christ-like. In word, deed, thought, relationship to other, in purity and in holiness. Where with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. There might be things about me and there might be things about the way I preach that, that, that nettles you. Don't go out and tell other people, I, I, I like his preaching, but he gets on my nerves when he says this or when he says that. Pray for me. And if it's worth fixing, the one I work for will fix it. Because I'm wide open to his leadership. Listen to the third verse. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Endeavoring. Meaning that there's going to be challenges. Meaning that there will be occasions where we can be in disunity. But what do we do? We work from the scriptural premises of loving one another, forgiving one another, respecting one another. Endeavoring to keep the unity. Well, you know, this is what I'd like to see. I, this is what I'm going to see. This is what I'm going to do. But you might offend the dozen. I don't care about offense. This is what I want to do. That's not exactly endeavoring to keep the unity, is it? Well, no one's going to tell me what to do. That's not exactly keeping the spirit of unity, is it? Well, if you don't do it my way, if you don't do it my way, I'm not going to come to church anymore. I'm stepping back from that. I don't like the way that Mitchell does this. I'm, I'm not going to play anymore. I don't like the way that Russell's leading this alpha course, so I'm not going to be part of it. That young girl they got there. She's making our kids ship up and get in shape. They're coming home and telling us how they have to live their lives at school and at home and at church. And, and that's not the way we live. I don't want them under her influence. Mm. You're getting the picture, aren't you? See, the blessing of God is upon those who endeavor to keep the unity. I'm not surprised by that. For God said, blessed is the peacemaker. Blessed is the peacemaker. If you ever see a situation that you can add a little bit to and can calm the waters and make peace, jump in with both feet and ask for the leadership of the Holy Spirit because you'll be blessed if you make peace. Blessed is the peacekeeper. Not the strife stirrer up, not the agitator. I'd known Christians and their gift was agitating. Don't be an agitator. I got to quit. So when we nurture an atmosphere of unity, then we can expect God's blessing that will enrich our personal lives as well as our church life. Our church will function and be alive. Can I have five more minutes? I'm going to take it. I, I, I judge my audience not by the applause, but by the silence, and, and not a burden person to a thing. So thank you for an overwhelming, uh, almost a total consensus for five more minutes. God calls for his blessing also in the area of lordship, in the area of giving. Yeah, 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 I, know what you say. yeah I know he's going to get around to it. Listen, take it easy on me. I don't know if I've preached a message solely on tithing in 12 years, and you have been giving incredibly. You are ranking high in the churches across Canada, and I thank God for that. Because you see, if I just preach on giving, you get mad enough to make and want to make me stop so much that you'll start giving, and that's the wrong attitude. But I preach a lot on the Lordship of Christ, because when he's Lord, he's Lord of your finances, he's Lord of your time, he's Lord of everything, right? That's what Lord means. See, it's an oxymoron to say, no, Lord. It's an oxymoron. It's, it's, it's opposites. It's, it's doesn't exist. You can't say no, Lord, because if He's Lord, 
It's, yes, sir. Some of you will get that later on. But in the area of lordship, particularly in giving, in Malachi chapter 3, let me, uh, let me read Malachi this morning, just a, a couple of verses there in Malachi. For those of you that are not totally familiar with the Old Testament, it's the very last book in the Old Testament that comes right between the page that says New Testament and starts with Matthew. It's, it's, it's Malachi chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. Bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now with, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer. A lot of people stop at the 10th verse and lose the incredible blessing of God and promise of God. When you and I are faithful in the tithe and offering principle, the tithe is giving God the 10% of what he enables you to make. Not the deductions from the income tax and from the, all these kind of things. What you make, he wants the cream of the crop of it. And when you do that, the second side of it not only will provide for you, but he's going to look at the devourer and say, you can't touch her. Amen. You can't touch him. You can't touch his family. Why can't I touch his family? Because I have made a promise. Amen. I've made a promise. Folk, I still believe this is the Word of God. I have shaken it. I have torn it. I have left it behind. I have loved it. I've cried on it. I've kissed it. I've neglected it. But it's still the Word of God. This is the Word of God. This is the Word of God. And I have lived my life as a believer and raised my family as a father with this conviction that as I have honored him, he will honor my children. Amen. I am going to speak shortly on the subject of covenant. Nobody in this building should miss that message. I'll introduce it in time for everybody to know. But there's something about moms and dads walking in covenant relation with God that pours blessings out on their family. And I'm going to explain a few things to you that God showed me 20, about 20 years ago as I was raising three rambunctious kids. Folk, I just believe God. He said, I will rebuke the 11th verse of Gal Gal Malachi 3. I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. He shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Oh, I could tell you some stories. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. How come? Because God will command his blessing upon us when we walk in obedience to what he calls us to do. Wow. Wow. What an incredible truth. God said there will be such an abundance that we will not be able to contain it. It is a blessing of provision. And here God challenges us to prove him. Just think about it for a moment. It would be audacious. It would be, it would be brazen for us to say, okay, God, prove yourself. You say you're there. You say you're going to care for us. You say you're going to provide for us. you got all this command. Prove yourself, God. Prove yourself. And I believe this is the only place in the scripture where God says, you prove me. Wow. Stop it for a moment. God said, prove me. Be faithful in tithes and offerings. Be faithful in your finances to so finance the work of God. Be faithful in, the, in bringing in the tithe and the offering of your increase. Prove me. God invites us to prove him. So there are I'm coming to my conclusion. There are two specific blessings here within in, in Malachi chapter 3. There is the giving of his blessing from the windows of heaven. There will be such abundance that we will not be able to contain it. It's called the blessing of provision. The commanded blessing. I can almost see God now, and I, I can tell you some stories if I had time and, 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 and the, and the research to remind me of what they all are. Of where there have been drought and where there has been drought, whether it's in the fishing industry or the, or the farming industry or in other ways. And all of a sudden, someone's nets are full, 
And all of a sudden, while the fields around, the bigger fields around are all withered, somebody's is green and producing. And behind the story, you find a family that honors God with tithe and offerings. You say, Pastor, that's a bit ridiculous. Only if you don't believe the Word of God. Vice versa. I know people who, who, who hoard everything they get and wouldn't give to God, and they wonder why God's not blessing their lives. Now you know, if you're here this morning in that position, you need to repent of your disobedience to God and begin to honor God with the tithe and the offering and the first fruits of His increase in your life and watch God fulfill His promise. That's the first blessing. It's the blessing of our vision. The second one are the promises to rebuke the devourer. It's an authoritative blessing from God in the form of protection and deliverance. Wow. Let me say that again. His promise to rebuke or hold back the devourer is an authoritative blessing from God in the form of protection and deliverance. And it's for every person in this building. It's for every mom and dad. It's for every teenager. It's for every older person. It's for every retired person. It's for everybody living on social assistance. It's for everybody living on support from the government. If you will honor God, God will walk you through the circumstances of your life and provide for you. And you can turn your diff air to this message and you'll stay in your own pitiful state. And if you get obnoxious enough, God will take away what you have because he said, I want you to prove me. I want you to prove me. Listen, folk, as you begin to serve God, guess whose t- attention you get beside God's? The devourer. We got to do something about that gal. We got to do something about that, that guy. We got to do something about that couple. We got to do something about that retired senior citizen guy who's supporting the work of God. We got to attack them. God says, you can't do it. They're under my blessing. They're under my blessing. And let me conclude with this, because I'm going to pick it up next Sunday. Lord willing. This is not a get-rich scheme. If you give to God because, God's, because God said, if you'll give to me, I'll, I'll increase your... If you give for that reason, keep your money. God don't want it. Church don't need it. Because that's the wrong attitude. But when you give out of obedience to the Word of God, you say, God, you are Lord of my life. I am going to walk in unity. I am going to walk in trust and obedience. I am going to walk in the, in the area, uh, in obedience, in the area of, 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 of the tithe and the offering. I'm going to do that, Lord. Out of my devotion to you, you will find that God's attention will be all over you. This stepping out to prepare ourselves for the commanded blessing of the Lord is a risk from the natural point of view. It can be sacrificial, and it means giving away. Folk, I want to be honest with you. I want my life and I want my family to live under the commanded blessings of God because we walk in obedience to God. I want this church that God has privileged me to pastor for these last number of 12 years or so. I want this church to live under the commanded blessing of God. How do you think we got this building if it wasn't the commanded blessing of God? How do you think we got this land? How do you think we got the finances to take care of this building if it wasn't the commanded blessing of God? It's the commanded blessing of God. And I cover it as the senior pastor of this church and pray that the Spirit of God will just be free here to work in our lives. I want to live under, under the commanded blessing. I want God to be able to say, I command my blessing on that brother. I command my blessing on that young man. I command my blessing on that sister. I command my blessing on that pastor I, because they walk in obedience. I command my blessing on that church because the people in it walk in obedience. Amen.